Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready for Rumble! you guys yeah. nice to have you on it's uh it's... sorry this took sorry this took so long i apologize uh, no it's it's all good you're a busy man honestly uh whenever i messaged you i did not even expect a response um <laughs> and and it just uh whenever you responded i was elated so uh oh uh, no no worries man i uh i try to i was in your spot once i mean there weren't podcasts around when i was trying to get going but uh I always try to do as many as I can because uh, uh, I was probably like you guys enjoyed doing this when I was younger and uh, was looking for a place to do it. Right. Well, we uh, we definitely appreciate that. And uh, actually, one of my mentors, um, Jim Lang, uh, he uh, he's kind of helped me uh, through this. Uh, he told me if I ever have you on, I have to ask you about a flag football injury. I don't know what it is. He would not tell us more than that. He just said. Ask James about his flag football injury. Well, I mean, I don't know which one Jimmy's referring to because I that was kind of – Ray Ferraro would always make a point of saying on the air because uh, there are numerous times I would show up to the set or to a game on location with a flag football injury. Uh, <laughs> and I would always try to compare it, you know. Ray, I've been through everything you've been through. It's just you did it in the NHL and I did it in beer league flag football. So, uh there's there was one time when I had a pulled uh it was a groin or a quad or something but I couldn't sit right in my chair and like it was a I couldn't talk right the entire show <laughs> there was also a time I got knocked out oh wow in the game and uh I had like bad post concussion for a few months to the point where Bob would look at me <laughs> like on some shows and says you can't formulate a sentence tonight are you okay <laughs> <laughs> so that was the it was the one sport I always played, right? For from basically twenty to uh probably fifty I could probably quit at. Uh so yeah. <laughs> that was there were numerous flag football injuries. Well, Jim, that was for you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um I mean, again, thank you for coming on. I mean, you've had a, a huge year uh going to the World Cup. Uh I mean, not many people can say they, they do that. Uh, especially going to another country. I mean, yeah, that's pretty cool. Try and get to some games when it comes to uh, to Canada next time around. But uh, how was that going to Qatar? Before I answer, I'm fascinated by these posters behind you. Ooh. So, so we have a segment at the end of the end of our show uh, called Five Minutes for Fighting." Uh, okay. in, in Cornwall, we had a, a local men's senior team. It, it was mostly fighting on ice. Hockey yeah. was in between the whistles. <laughs> yeah, right. um, you could call that hockey. Well, that, that's yeah. okay. senior hockey period, right? Yeah. <laughs> there. So our two regulars that are on, this is uh, the one poster, Paul Shantz, uh, and next to him is my cousin, Corey Payment. Uh, so we try and switch up the decor every week. So I figured I'd give these boys a little nod. And my, and my dad's always messaging me for sneak peeks. So I got uh, I love it. behind me with UP. I love it. I love it. Paul Shantz, Corey Payment. Yeah, it sounds like some of those like trade deadline deals I do when I don't I never heard of the guy. Yeah, yeah. definitely future considerations. Yeah, yeah there are players um, players to be named later. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, sorry, the World Cup. Yeah, it was one of the it was one of the great experiences of my career. Uh, I before I played flag football, I played soccer my entire life growing up, and uh, and and loved the game. And you know, my career got sidetracked into hockey and football and all those other things but it was always at the back of my mind that the thing I'd really love to do is a world cup I was fortunate enough to do the women's world cup in 2015 the one in Canada which was awesome with Christine Sinclair and everyone uh and then to do this one to be the first one that Canada was into since 86 uh I don't pretend and I said to the guys on air you know I don't it's hard when you cover so many different sports and when you have families and such uh 
I can't watch every Premier League game, Bundesliga game. I'm not as big. My knowledge base compared to like the Luke Wildmans of the world is not the same, but I've watched the national team, like every national team game for probably five years. So I'm probably more into international soccer. And so World Cup is, you know, look, at it's the biggest sporting event in the world. And to be there, and this was such a unique, well, we'll never have this again, I don't think, where the entire World Cup was basically in a city the size of, you know, um, mid-sized Canadian city, essentially. Yeah. Three, a city of 300,000. So uh, for 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 it to be there and the whole world coming to one place. And that's the thing I always say the coolest part of it, I think was the fact that uh, the whole world was there. Like the market where, which you saw in the background of our set, if you'd go there on, you know, any day, you'd have thousands of people from, you know, all these 32 different countries, which is just to me, the coolest thing. Uh, the entire world was really there. And I never seen that in an event. I've covered Olympics before, but the world doesn't really come to Olympics maybe families of the athletes, a few people from different places, but the world really comes to a world cup and to have them all in one place was, was sensational. So yeah, it was a, it was an incredible experience. So other than the Canadian fans, because obviously Canadian fans are the best. Uh, what country were you like impressed by that fan base? Well, the Brazil was staying at our hotel. Um, and, so that was the fan base I got the the most experience with because every night, essentially, and particularly the night of Brazil games, there would be one to 2,000 of them outside our hotel with all sorts of musical instruments going all night long. <laughs> so they were the ones I was sort of kind of exposed to the most, and they were fantastic. Uh, so I, I, I would say the Brazilians and I was kind of rooting for them. I mean, I was like everybody else kind of rooting for Messi, but I would have liked to see Brazil win because I do think they play the most beautiful football. And uh, yeah. So now when I say they're in our hotel, we didn't, it's not like Neymar's in the room next to me. They, yeah, yeah, they yeah, cordoned yeah. off an area of the hotel <laughs> and, uh, and we never saw any of the players, but there was the fans were everywhere. Well, I definitely enjoyed watching you. Uh, you cover that. I mean, especially, like you said, like, I don't watch Bundesliga or, or the Premier League or anything like that. I'll catch the odd MLS game. Uh, but international soccer is fun to watch. Uh, so it was nice to see a familiar face and not, uh, you know, some, you know, a, a British guy or, or somebody, you know, well, thank trying, you, thank to, you for trying to dumb the game down for us. It was nice to have somebody <laughs> that I could relate to talking to me. No, nobody, dumb, nobody dumbs it down better than me. <laughs> no, not not what I meant. Yeah, but uh, yeah, no, no, I, it's okay. First it's and okay. last appearance for James Duffy on the show. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 I don't take it that way whatsoever. In fact, I, I, I actually take that in many ways as my job. And I'm sure there's some diehard soccer fans that didn't want me there, right? That that only want soccer commentators there. And I under, I totally understand that too. But I, I think the World Cup, especially a World Cup with Canada attracts a lot of fans that don't watch the game a lot right and so i take that as part of my job and you have to walk a fine line you have to be knowledgeable enough to ask the right questions but i think you also have to not dumb it down that's that's not the probably the proper phrase even though there's truth and elements to it but i, I think you have to ask the questions and make sure your analysts talk in a way that's understandable for Mm -hmm. that the diehard soccer fans appreciate but also new fans of the game would appreciate so that was constantly on my mind the whole tournament right is to make this relatable to you know hockey fans who are just turning in because it's canada or whatever but still to uh appease the diehard soccer fans too and that's always the fine line you walk when you do something like that so trust me i took no offense to what you said oh good thank <laughs> yeah. god yeah. thank god well uh, earning bridges here at average job yeah sir. <laughs> yeah um, so before we move on from that, I mean, you've covered the World Cup, which you said, you know, and I agree with is one of the largest tournaments in the world uh, and probably the most recognizable sport uh, universally. Um, and you've covered the Olympics, you covered the World Juniors. What's one uh, sporting event that you would like to cover before you retire? You know, somebody asked me this while we were having beers at the World Cup, and I didn't have an answer yet because the world cup was the number one thing on my list. And so I'm going to have to come up with, with another one. I mean, a world cup in your country four years from now would be pretty darn cool, 
But, uh, and I don't want this to come out the wrong way like I've done everything because I haven't. But most of the stuff that I always wanted to do, I've been lucky enough to be able to do. And so, man, maybe it would be, you know, F1, which is probably the fastest growing popularity sport in the world. And I was not into it, but my, my daughter's boyfriend's really into it. And he's getting me into it. And I've watched the Netflix series and everything. So, you know, maybe an F1 race like the Grand Prix of Montreal. Just uh, my two cents. I would love to see you do what Joe Rogan does. <laughs> Post-match, just super sweaty, guys bloody, middle of the octagon. James Duffy in there. I feel <laughs> that or do what Bruce Buffer does before the fight. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Any you know, back I, I never, I've never gotten into UFC. I appreciate it and everything like that, but I, I, I have not gotten into it. And I would be, uh, uh, I, I'm also smart enough to know when I don't know anything, and I don't know anything about UFC. But uh, uh, back in the day, like when I was younger, boxing was much bigger, right? Boxing is sort of UFC, sort of kickboxing's ass, but. Uh, I was big into boxing when I was young. So if you'd asked me that question 20 years ago, you know, I would have said a title fight, you know, the heavyweight championship of the world when back in the days when Mike Tyson was around or when it really mattered, but it doesn't really matter much anymore. It seems to. So yeah, maybe UFC at some point. Uh, I don't know what else really. Uh, I've never, I mean, I've, I've never hosted a World Series or anything like that, but baseball doesn't move me the way it used to, so that's not high on my list. So I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to come. I'll try to come up with one by the end of the, uh, by the end of the uh, interview. But uh, um, there's nothing like pressing in my head now that I have to do this before I, before I'm done. That's fair. This, this is one of the interviews for me where I was just. Uh, I've said on numerous episodes now. It, you know, every time we got like a former player on or something, it's. Like, it's special, it's nice, it's cool to hear the stories, but I was never an athlete. Like, I, I was an average jock at best. Yeah, uh, I played right. center, yeah, you and that was the only time I touched the football. Yeah. He, he was our QB. Yeah. Um, and Where was that? This is high school? This yeah. is high school. That's, we didn't go any farther than that, yeah. James. Yeah. I had one season of my flag football league around here, and that was enough for me. Yeah. <laughs> so, that, I mean, high school was the uh, same thing. I was glory days in high school. I went to Gloucester in Ottawa, and... Uh, we only had 23 players, I think, are my senior year in high school. So, uh, I, you know, you, I went both ways. Yeah, you're playing. You have to. You got to be. Gotta be. Yeah, I thought I was going to be. I, I literally up to grade like 13, grade 13 back in my day. Yeah. Thought I was. I, I thought I had a legitimate chance to probably not play in the NFL, but play in the CFL. Like I was, I was somewhat de delusional because I was, you know, 5'10", 145 <laughs> pounds at that time. <laughs> Sounds like me. White cornerback uh, with mediocre speed. Yeah, I, yeah. I got through my head pretty quick. I, I wasn't making it anywhere. Uh, <laughs> and, and I strictly shifted my focus to uh, the TSN panel uh, being my heroes. And uh, my mom being a teacher, it took a lot of convincing, but allowed me to stay home uh, every year at uh, trade deadline day. And it was like my one fake sick, I'll call in, you're good. Uh, you can stay home with the boys. Uh, and I would always have like a text chain of all my buddies and I would text pretty much word for word where you guys are going and it'd be like uh, break and trade. And then it's like going this way, going that way. Um, so I always idolize you guys. So this to me is, is like my world cup. Oh, thank uh, you. The only thing oh, better is, nice if, uh, is if like your, your Instagram video, uh, I, what is it? Is uh, what car? Oh God! Oh, I watched the, it. the Lincoln Nautilus thing. Yeah, okay. and and then <laughs> you switch over. The only thing you can do better is if you turn your camera and Bobby was sitting next to you. That's that's yeah. the only way this is getting better for me. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. Um, by the way, I think I thought of your answer. Um, I think I would. This is not an event because I've covered a million of them, but I would like to see a Canadian team win the Stanley Cup and and cover that because you know it's been forever now. And I, yeah. you know, there was a run back in the early 2000s where they were in the finals every year, right? Like yeah. uh, Edmonton was there and then Ottawa was there and so on and so forth. But in Vancouver in 2000, 2011 cup final against Boston. And uh, Montreal in 2020. <coughs> yes. Uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, I, uh, I would love to see and cover a, a Canadian team winning the Stanley cup before I'm done. So, uh, uh, and as for trade, trade deadline you see it's a sucker it's it's i i should hate you for this buddy because uh 
that's why we have to be on the air for 12 hours every year i'm like can we just do this for five or six hours and they say no too many people watch. you know what uh, i will endorse the five or six hours my ass is numb by hour three yeah, yeah. Uh, mine too <laughs> <laughs> uh i i always like the uh like who is it that would normally like live tweet some photos of somebody grabbing pizza or like hurrying up yeah. commercial break to go to the bathroom um yeah. That's that's pretty much what it's like at my house too during the commercial break on those days. Uh, only make what I can cook in the in the three minutes that uh, you're you're going to commercial while I'm. Well, it's funny. I, my theory on trade deadline is that uh, the re part of the reason it does so well, I think, is not just for people looking for the information, but because people t tune in to see actually how we're going to fill all those hours. And it's kind of like rubbernecking at an accident scene, right? Yeah. You, you go, well, how, are the, how are these idiots going to talk for 10 hours straight? And I think some of the funnest times on Trade Center is when we, we get a little loopy and run out of things to say, which happens quite often. So, uh, uh, yeah, there is a, uh, there's a sickness that you guys have in watching that show. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it it's, kind of celebrates the sickness that Canadian hockey fans have, don't you think? Yeah, yeah it, it is. Yeah. And uh Whatever, I'll I'll embrace it. I I will yeah. watch as long yeah. as you are on. Hey, we um, we love we we love you for it. You know. Yeah. Well, staying with the trade deadline, I know there's been a few years where I've been watching, and you know, you guys call some players, and the players are a little surprised to hear that they've been traded because they haven't either agent hasn't got to them or something like that. Right. I think it was. I can't. I think it was. I don't know if it's Anthony Stewart. I can't remember. I remember you guys called. I think him. it was Chris. Chris Stewart. Yes, thank yeah. you. Yeah. You guys called him and you were like, "So how does it feel to get traded?" You know, and he was like, "Well, I haven't talked to my agent yet." So like, other than that, like, have you had, have and you had any other like times where you called players and been like, you know, and they're like, "Well, I don't know yet. I'll call you back." Or well, that was. I I think that was the moment because uh, Gino Retta actually in the background makes a lot of those calls for us and uh you know we sort of he gets numbers from myself and bob and drags and the numbers he has and so in the case of chris he got a hold of him right away and said hey can you come on with james on on trade center and he said sure and he didn't know yet and i didn't know like when i i assume every time like it just comes to me like the producer talks in my ear and just says hey we got chris stewart he's just been traded to in this case, it was Minnesota, I think, or it'd be yeah, traded. I think, yeah, I think Buffalo yeah. to Minnesota, maybe. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and uh, so I assume he knows. I'm like, "What do you think of the trade?" And he goes, uh, "What is it?" <laughs> and I go, "Okay." <laughs> <laughs> it was. It Pack was your bags. You're going to Minnesota. Yeah. You know, and it's funny because everybody in the studio is laughing as your reaction would be, would be, which is a natural reaction. But at the same time, I felt a little bit you know, guilty afterwards, because there are families involved here and wives and kids that get pulled out of school. So I, I try to always think of, of that at the same time, but he took it, you know, incredibly well. And he's like, okay, no problem. I'm off to, I'm off to Minnesota. Uh, I, I think quite often we'll get guys right afterwards before they've really had time to think about it. But that's the only time I can remember um, that, that the guy had not, that I actually had to break the trade to the guy on the air. And so that was, that was one of the, uh, yeah, that was one of the all timers on trade center. I mean, only one time in the amount of years you've been on trade deadline day. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty good. I think. Yeah. It's not bad. That's not I bad. mean, that's almost like what, uh, I mean, Billy Bean did to, uh, or I guess Brad Pitt did to Jonah Hill's character in Moneyball, where <laughs> yeah. you got to practice calling these guys. Yeah. Call right. You've been traded. Yeah. So uh, right. yeah. you've also got a taste yeah. of what it's like to be a GM. Uh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I think that, oh, by the way, I mean, there have been definitely other guys who have found out that they've been traded on Trade Center. I think that would that happens regularly. Maybe not so much anymore. I think the teams are, you know, Trade Center is not what it used to be in the sense of breaking trades, right? It's not like Bob McKenzie or Darren Drager or Pierre Lebrun, whoever, breaks breaks all the deals anymore. The, the vast majority of time now, teams send it out on their Twitter, whatever. And I, I don't think the breaking of trades has become as important as just you know, the analyzing and yeah. so on that comes afterwards. But, uh, oh, yeah, there's been numerous times where guys have found out that they have been traded. And, you know, Bob Bob used to be, be so connected. I can remember there was one year early on where, you know, quite often it's the assistant general managers and the scouts and stuff that are feeding the information to the insiders. Mm -hmm. 
And so all these teams are in a room and I, I think one year, so the GM's on the phone, on the speaker phone, making a deal. The assistant GM texts Bob. Bob goes on air and says the deal and the call's not even over. So the GM is sitting there on the phone watching this TV screen and the trade that he's just done 30 seconds ago is coming up on the screen. And he's like, what the? <laughs> <laughs> Looking around the room, see who's got yeah. their phone out. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the power of Bob McKenzie. I think that's awesome. Actually, that. Jimmy, Jimmy was telling me, so I was telling him the other day, uh, you know, he, he's written a couple books with Bob now. Yeah. Uh, and, and he's like, you know, Bob has two phones, even though he's still, he's retired or retired. Um, you know, and, and he has one that it's hockey phone, one is family phone, but that hockey phone can go off constantly. Yeah. And it just, again, kind of like you said, Bob, Bob McKenzie. I think, I think he might've turned in the hockey phone. Oh. <laughs> he, Bob is, uh, you know, Bob is still so awesome at the World Juniors and when he's on trade deadline or whatever, but he is focused on his retirement now, so he does not make the calls. Yeah, that he so uh, the, Bo- the Bobby Margarita phone is in. Is yeah, in- yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's he, right. He's got one phone for Bobby Margarita now and one phone yeah. for family. <laughs> <laughs> um, so talk about a couple guys that should be retired now. Uh, Yamir Yager now becomes the oldest player to score in the Czech League, assisted by 40-year-old Thomas Pokanek. I mean, yeah. I mean, we're we're not at that age yet, Adam. No, but yeah, no. I've kind of retired myself at 27 from men's league sports. Uh, <laughs> you know, you James had a little lengthier career. You're saying retiring from flag football at, at about 50, right? Um, like one of these guys is just gonna hang it up. Uh, well, Yager is just a freak and always has been. And I mean, he really is retired. I guess when he he owns the team and they were short a player or something when he came yeah. out, but. That guy is – the funny thing is I could see Ovechkin being like Yager. Like I have no doubt now he's going to break the record and smash it because that whole, you know, Russian machine don't break – never breaks down thing is true, right? For that guy to play, you know, a pretty physical game of hockey for his entire career and ne- basically never be hurt is is ludicrous. And so there's just, I don't know, something in the water over in Russia and the Czechs. Yeah. Uh, so I, I could I could see Ovi playing until 45 or something like that and still chipping in 25 goals. Um, but Yager was a freak and, you know, really became a physical, like into his, in, you know, at 45, he was the guy that was showing up at the gym at, you know, midnight and working out till 2 a.m. at the rink. So uh, I don't know that we'll, we'll see too many like him again, but that is, is really unbelievable because it's a young man's game now, right? The peak players used to peak at 30 and, I almost think now like 25 almost yeah. is your, is your peak, right? Like 20, if you're not a superstar by like 23, 24, 25, it's probably not going to happen. Those are the guys that are running yeah. the league right now. So uh, man, more power to these guys that can hang around till till 40 or in Yager's case, 50. Yeah. No, it's, it's <laughs> that's, crazy. That's wild. Yeah. As long as he keeps bringing back the lamb chops, he can play at least 60. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, let's let's talk about the World Juniors since that's probably fresh on your mind. Mm. How beautiful is is watching that game? And I mean, I know we we talked, you know, Sidney Crosby, Nate McKinnon, big guys from from the Nova Scotia area. Um, how cool is it to be out there for the World Juniors? I think I tweeted this. It was one of my favorites ever, and I don't want to pass judgment now. I maybe I'll do that when I retire. Sometimes you need time to to think back on these things. Uh, but it, if it's not Ottawa and, and in 2009 or whatever, the Everly year for numerous reasons, my hometown and this one are probably one and one a is my favorites ever. First of all, you know, to be back in a smaller town, uh, not this, you know, Halifax is a city, but you know what I mean? Like junior yeah. size rank and everything. They were starving for it because it hadn't been there in 20 years. Just great hockey people. I'd never been to a world junior where everybody was talking about it. Every restaurant you went into every coffee shop, it's all they were talking about the entire week. They were there for the relegation games, the crappy games, the great games. And to have that quality of hockey, you know, to have so many upsets and then overtime in the quarters, USA in the semis overtime for the gold medal, you know, an eight, seven bronze medal game. When you put all those things together, it's a really, it's a hard tournament to top. 
And to watch what Bedard did, I'm sure everybody's sick of us talking about Bedard, but I'm not. You I'm not. not yeah. It was unbelievable. Like, uh, I just, I still can't wrap my head around the fact that he's 17. Like, if he was 19 and did that, it would be phenomenal. Mm -hmm. The fact that he's 17 and could actually come back for two more World Juniors is nuts. Like, look at, look at what Connor McDavid is now, and he did not dominate at all at 17. He was really good, but yeah. he did not dominate whatsoever, and. No, nor did Sidney Crosby at 17, nor did pretty much anybody else you can mention here. And and Bedard just dominated. So, again, I'm not saying he's going to be better than McDavid. You know, he has things. McDavid has things that is a unicorn and that nobody will have. Yeah. But I'm just fascinated to see what he will be uh, because he's, again, he's 17. And maybe he's not the fastest and he's not the biggest and he's not the strongest and all these other things, but he just figures out a way to beat people. Mm -hmm. And that's the greatest intangible you could ever have. And so I can't wait to see what kind of NHL he's going to be. Do you think like, and it's different. I find watching it on TV compared to live, but being a smaller forward. And I mean, you know, his, the way he skates and the way he handles the puck does look like a young Sidney Crosby does look like a Connor McDavid, the way he can walk through people. Mm-hmm. Do you find his size difference compared to those two players? Um, like, do you notice that at all on the ice? Like, no, because he's big. He's big. Uh, the thing about hockey players, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're big. They have big asses and big legs. Yeah. Right. That like Crosby, the first time I saw him in person, that's what freaked me out. Uh, I mean, I've seen him as a junior, but to see him, you know, as a rookie, I think in the NHL or his second year, he's they used to call him uh creature that was his nickname in pittsburgh the first couple of years because his ass and his legs were just like this and bedard has that already i'm not saying he's crosby size but i think it when bedard's 23 or something he's he's gonna have that yeah, and that's where that's where so much of it comes from in hockey so i'm uh, very similar i think probably to crosby in size uh and he could still grow right he's 17 he could grow an inch or two so I thought Kelly Rudy said this on Hockey Night in Canada, and we were saying the same thing in 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 Halifax. I, I think the best comparable to me right now is probably Mitch Marner. I think he'll be better than Mitch Marner, which says a lot because Mitch Marner is a really good player. But just his shiftiness, the way he moves, the his ability with the puck, I think that's the close that he's not doesn't look that much like Crosby, that much like McDavid. There's little similarities here and there. Yeah, you know, shoots the puck a little like Austin Matthews, but he moves like Marner in my estimation, and I think he'll be a a better version of Mitch Marner, which I again is is a heck of a compliment. I think uh, a more a goal. He's got a way better shot. So, yeah. uh, you know, I'm, I'm putting Mitch Marner with Austin Matthews' shot and goal scoring ability. I'm sorry, I'm just using Leafs here for no, <laughs> no, that's that's okay. The Leafs, but, but you put out a great short. Um, I think it was right after the tournament and it was talking to uh his his i guess his, his parents house their neighbor oh yeah him shooting yeah. like that was a if you haven't watched that you need yeah. to, like that was a great short uh mm -hmm. and kind of a testament at one point he really hurt his wrist and just yeah the busted he busted one wrist yeah so he's he was he didn't want to stop playing hockey so he was shooting pucks with one wrist his opposite wrist i think yeah and, and, and he was like firing yeah. backhands over the net one handed, which to me makes no sense whatsoever. Right. Yeah. I had a I, hard time lifting the puck was, in grade 10. I like was just yeah. back, yeah. backhand with, yeah. uh, with, with oh. one hand where, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. But the one thing I would say when you, when you talk about, you know, McDavid, Crosby, whatever, look at anybody who makes the nhl it's to me it's an incredible accomplishment that's why i'm always i when, when we sit there and carve story if you can hear squeaking it's my dog Hold on you know what that's okay uh you are you are not the first uh i can hear my dog walking upstairs right now so so uh that's my dog with a cone <laughs> head right now oh uh, uh, what a cutie uh, yeah because you know what some... i've uh i i recognize both those pops yes and uh he quite enjoys the squeaky ball, so I'll try to keep him occupied. But that's okay. The, you know, anybody who makes it to the NHL has to be incredibly driven. 
right? You, you know, that whole 10,000 hours of practice to get there. And plus you have to have a ton of talent, but I think there's something different and similar um, between like the, the Crosby's, you know, going back the Gretzky's, the McDavid's, but let's just take this generation. So just say Crosby, McDavid, Bedard. They all are so driven and so competitive. Uh, there was a story about Sid, I remember. His agent told me that his agent had him over for dinner and uh, he was playing checkers with his agent's eight-year-old son. And the son beat him in checkers. And Crosby basically, the second he'd lost, flipped the board like across the room. <laughs> and instantly, you know, oh my God, I'm so sorry, and cleaned it all up. But in that instant, like he hated losing so bad, even to a kid in checkers. And <laughs> I, I, those guys have that. And Connor Bedard has that. And it's just this crazy competitiveness that, and desire to be the best. And I, you know, it, it sounds silly to say desire to be the best because you think all players have it, but there's another level of it. And I think that's what, you know, one of the many things that separates the so-called generational players. And I think he has that. And like a big thing too, I noticed with uh, Bedard too, like, you know, they just won, they were interviewing him and they're the, the, I can't remember who was interviewing. I can't remember. Yeah, who, it was but, Kenzie and yeah, Kenzie you know, Lalonde. asked him, you know, about him and he said, it's not about me, it's about my team, you know, right there. You know, a lot of guys would still answer the question and then talk about his team. But right away, he said, you know, it's not about me. It's about my team. And this that's team. incredible maturity for a 17 year old. Don't you think? Yeah, that's insane. Yeah. And that that was I'll tell you guys, that was brewing the entire tournament. Like I could feel it basically from the day he got seven points against Germany, which was the second game. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It became about him. And I could see his discomfort growing. And we did this another interview where we walked along the harbor there. <laughs> And I, I could tell he was already getting uncomfortable with every question being about him. And he also didn't like that all the other players on his, the team were being asked about him. Like every question Shane Wright was being asked was about Bedard and Brennan Othman was about Bedard. And Bedard, I could see his discomfort with that because, you know, all these guys are superstars in their own junior town. And so I had to pull him aside and say, hey, I, I totally respect this, you know, that you don't want to talk about yourself. And when you go back to the rink and you want to defer in your scrums, no problem. But for the next 15 minutes, I need you to talk about yourself with me. And he was really good about it. But I think that. Uh... <laughs> no more. I think that uh, it, it is impressive for a 17 year old uh, to in that moment of just winning the medal to say, hey, I want this to be about the guys. And I really think in many ways, you know, there's part of me that says if Bedard scored that golden goal, it would have been the perfect ending to the tournament. But there's another part of me that thinks I'm really glad that it was somebody else. And basically that there were other heroes those last two games. And I really think that Bedard is probably really happy about it. That he's probably happier uh, for Dylan Gunther and, and you know, Shane Wright for getting that big goal than, than he would have been for him doing it. Because if he if he had scored the, the golden goal, then all we would ever remember from this tournament was Connor Bedard, right? Yeah. yeah. And I, I think he was really happy to just be one of the guys on that night. And that's that's um, I agree with that, especially like you know, all the, like you said, all the guys that played so well in that tournament. Unfortunately, you know, not unfortunately that it was behind Bedard because they did still talk about everybody, but like you know, it's just. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely. I mean, I was, I was. Uh, real whenever my name was in the local paper uh yeah, yeah. and then there's the side column in the sports section of ball hockey yeah you know? Lead, leading penalty minutes it i was, mean hey it's fantastic assist was two points in our ball hockey league so yeah. that's the only time i passed the box so yeah right right <laughs> <laughs> um i mean maybe somebody who isn't as as humble as, as connor bedard though uh last week would have been uh alexander ovechkin um after scoring a hat trick on our, our beloved Habs, uh, followed up by taking a nice selfie with uh, their moms on the mom trip, um, just, to, just to add a little salt to the wound. He took a selfie with the uh, the Habs moms? You, yeah. you didn't see this? No, I, 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 I think I must have missed it just because I was at the juniors probably. 
Okay, yeah. I, I will email this to you right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can imagine the shot. It was, it was but I love that, right? Yeah, I mean I, just, I think I think it's great. I think that's hilarious. The moms must have asked, right? Uh, they, I mean, well they they had to, or yeah. it's very uh I don't know, <laughs> cheeky of them, I guess. I love it. I love it. Even if it was against the Habs, I still love it. It's great. Yeah, it it's great. Really matter to me. There, I just sent that to you. Um yeah, it's uh, uh I like the Yuppie shot, by the way, back there. I was a big, uh, big Yuppie guy my entire life. So Ex the Expos, Expos were... Yuppie or, or Habs Yuppie? Uh, Expos Yuppie. I was a, the Expos were my, uh, despite what I said about baseball earlier, the Expos were my true love. And they occupied my life from like age, like 10 to 16. I just lived for the Expos. Off season, in season, every single game, uh, I love them. I would take the bus down. My dad would drop me the bus stop, and I'd take the bus down to Montreal to watch games. And uh, and then the 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 strike year, uh, sorry, lockout year, uh, and then the moving just crushed my love of baseball completely. But yeah. uh, I never, I wasn't. So I would live in Ottawa. You are a Cornwall, I guess, would be sort of different, where you're closer to Montreal, so it's probably mostly Mont Habs fans, right? Uh, maybe some Sens fans now. I say it's a it's a mix, honestly. Like I, really, it's yeah. tough though because the Sens came in in, in what ninety two. Yeah, around there. Yeah. So, you know, like you have a lot of families. Like you know, like for me, grandparents were were Habs fans, and then it you know my dad was a Habs fan, raised me a Habs fan, and I feel like it's the same thing with the Leafs. In the Habs, so unless there's people that like converted when the Sens came in. I feel like it's heavy Montreal, Toronto. Yeah. Okay, so same as Ottawa. Ottawa was like that, where you, you were, it was Leafs and Habs, 100%. And I kind of rebelled against both when I was a kid and, and chose the Chicago Blackhawks as my team. And then uh, that was my team when I was a little kid. And then I switched to the New York Islanders because uh, I liked Danny Potvin, came out of Ottawa and, uh, and followed them. And that worked out well because they won all those cups. But... Uh, yeah, you either I so I I was never a Habs fan. Didn't hate them or anything like that, but I didn't like the Habs. But uh, I was a huge Expos fan. Well, that's uh, that's fair. I'm I, I hope that they do get a baseball team back because I would like to see Montreal get a new mascot. Give give UP back and yeah. Well, they, yeah. they technically have that uh, the one the new one was a name metal. Is uh, that, is that his yeah, name? I get rid of him. I think that's his name. He wears the baby blue. Ever since he's been around with those baby blue jersey, Montreal is. Given up twenty one goals and twenty one goals. They haven't. They haven't won. Yeah. Well, much better <laughs> win. Let's be real. <laughs> I I don't think that the goal is to win. Uh, the management point. may not say it out loud, but I think they're going to go in hard on. Uh, that was That's the other okay. interesting. The other interesting thing about the World Juniors was, you know, there was a lot of scouts and GMs and assistant GMs in our hotel, and <laughs> uh, I would see them at breakfast most days. And the uh, without using the tank word, even though I just did. Uh, the, pur <laughs> the pursuit of Bedard is going to be intense, and for sure. uh, there was no one from Montreal that said anything to me, so I'm not reporting anything. But I, I think Montreal yes. will take, take it to the bank here, according to James Duffy. Yeah. <laughs> no, Montreal is going to be. I, I, I suspect Montreal is going to be down there in the bottom five uh, and make some deals of veteran well, I, players. I, hope so. I think they're at seven right now. The yeah. article you guys had out. Uh, uh, while I was uh, doing groceries, I was reading it while pushing the cart and uh, had, I think, Montreal at seventh, uh, seventh in the uh, lottery draft standing. Yeah, but... I bet they'll be, I bet they'll be top five. But like I said, they're going to have some competition because there are some teams that are just going to just tank so hard. Yeah, yeah, do whatever they can to get those. Which will be fun for us around trade deadline if teams are trying to unload veterans, right? Oh, but I think they might do it before trade deadline because they want to tank faster. Right. I hope so. You That's know what? Fair. Move Jake Allen and um... yeah, so, um, <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of guys in one shot that I'd like to yeah. see go, but we're here sitting talking to James Duffy and yeah. they're the managers. Yeah. Have, so well I think talking James Yeah, Duffy. I think so too. Yeah, <laughs> less 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 gray experience. hair. I mean, come on, dude. Yeah. I like all this gray hair. But uh um like you said you've seen a lot of guys come through like like sport and stuff like that. Like who is the like when you first started like doing the you know sports reporting stuff like that. Who was like the first like player or athlete or even like co-host that you like you know fangirled over? Right? Geeked yeah. out. Yeah, geeked out. There, God, I'm trying to think of a different term instead of. Like, yeah, no, yeah. that's okay. 
Um, it's a great question. The, the first one that pops into my mind. So I started at TSN in 98 and I'd done, you know, I did local sports in Ottawa. So, uh, I, I had gotten to interview, you know, Mario Lemieux, Wayne Gretzky, a, a few people there in, in scrums, you know, being the local Ottawa reporter. But I think the first time I really lost it was, you know, football was probably my favorite sport, right? If you'd asked me, uh, you know, hockey was right there, but football was a touch above for me. And I'm a big Niners fan, you might know. Yes, uh, sir. We, Let's go, Jay. Yeah, I knew I liked you for a reason. Yes. And, uh, and I was really passionate. Of, I was probably more passionate about the Niners than I was any other sports team back then uh, after the Expos. So when the Expos were gone, I think the Niners really started to fill that void for me. And Ronnie Lott was my favorite player of all time. The only I have the only two jerseys I've ever owned in any sport are Tim Raines, Expos, and Ronnie Lott 49ers jersey. I, I still kept the run. It's the only thing I kept is I have a – uh, uh, a Ronnie Lott jersey from the Niners. We'll, we'll, we'll send you an average jock jersey. We'll just copy it the back. Send me a I will cherish effort. it. I will cherish <laughs> it. And, you know, all my passwords, I should give this away, were always had 42 yeah, at the number, end. What, who you bank with. <laughs> yeah. um, Everything had 42. I always chose 42, like my pick lottery numbers, no matter what. So I get to TSN, and in my first, uh, probably a month or two into my time at TSN, uh, the, one of the producers calls me and says, Ronnie Lott's coming to town. And, you know, doing this thing for like NFL Canada and uh, we got a chance to interview him. Do you want to do it? And I, I freaked out and I can still remember, Hey, I kept staring at his finger. You, I don't know yeah. if you guys know the <laughs> yeah. legendary Ronnie Locke and his yeah, finger his cut pinky, off. He didn't yeah. want to miss a game, <laughs> but there was some sort of maintenance or renovation going on in the next studio. And so this jackhammer kept going and we kept having to interrupt the interview. We only had, you know, 15 minutes with Ronnie Lott. He didn't know who the hell I was. So it was just like, I'm sure he wanted to get the hell out of there and move on with his day. And I was starting to get so nervous uh, because, sorry, sorry, Mr. Lott, we have to, we'll have to stop that and start it again because the stupid noise in the next studio. And I could see the sweat starting to build up on my brow. Like this whole Ronnie Lott interview is going to go to hell. But he was really classy about it. And that was, I think that's the first time I, I was really, really geeked out or fangirling, like you say, because uh, he was like, he was my guy, the my entire uh, life. And you know what? The year before that, uh, I was working in Vancouver the year before I came to TSN. And I actually, I got sent on an assignment. I was working as a news reporter in Vancouver and I got sent to do something at Disneyland in Anaheim. And I, I the Niners were playing the Packers in the NFC Championship game. And I made a side trip to San Francisco to see the game and got got a, a field pass. The Niners got their asses kicked, Steve Young, by Brett Favre and the Packers. But uh, Jerry Rice wasn't playing that game. He was probably, probably my second favorite guy to, uh, to Ronnie Lott. And so we went into the – I remember my cameraman had no batteries left, so the camera was dead. But I said – he said, I like, let's go into the dressing room and do some interviews. And he's like, well, my camera's dead. I said, I don't care. Let's just fake it. I just want to go in there and do interviews, right? So he had a dead camera. And Jerry Rice hadn't played, but he was standing there in his suit. And I'm like, screw this. I got a chance to interview Jerry Rice. I'm going to do it. And so I walked up to him and I said, Jerry, can I, can I, uh, can I get a word with you? And uh, he said, uh, F off, man. Talk to somebody who plays. <laughs> <laughs> so I, was I, was I was devastated oh, that's great. <laughs> and you know what like it, it's not like he was being an ass I mean a bit of an ass but more so I think it's the fact he was just re he's a another one of these guys that we're talking about ultra competitive oh, and man. even though he hadn't played he was really mad they lost right and so I was just some punk ass who came up to him and shoved the camera in his face so it, it you know it didn't ruin my my uh adoration of Jerry Rice but I I walked I really walked away with my tail between my legs after that. Part. That's great. You know what? That's awesome. The uh, the the battery dead faking. I would have probably did the same play. Yeah. Well, you're already there, right? You might yeah. as well just keep going. You know the funny thing, the subscript to that. Brent Jones was the tight end for the 49ers then. Pretty good tight end. Played a long time in the NFL. Won a whole bunch of Super Bowls. So he was there, and he just come out of the shower and sat down in front of his locker. And I'm like, okay, let's do Brent Jones. So I run over to my cameraman. And I think the other, other like the the real reporters, all the San Francisco and national reporters were all around Steve Young. 
So I get around Brent Jones and I'm like, uh, Brent, uh, you know, you talked about this maybe being your last season. Uh, what are you feeling right now? And he's like, well, yeah, you know what? This is it. I'm, I'll announce it right now. I'm going to retire. <laughs> I don't think you want to announce it right now because I don't have a camera that works. And I'm from a Vancouver news station. So maybe you want to wait till everybody else comes over here. But I always wow. remember Brent Jones announces retirement to me with no uh, no functional camera. Uh, wow, that's uh, that's great. Yeah, that's still that's a still a great story to have yeah. though, in your back pocket. Yeah. Um. So, wow. That's, that, speaking that, of, I mean, yeah. all stars for you guys. Um. I, I I mean I don't know if you how, if you watch any of the competition, but. Uh, Jeff Marek was, was I'm watching them right now at the Leafs game if you keep you see me looking up I'm just trying to keep pace of what's going on in the Leafs game <laughs> that's okay that's okay are they winning uh, I think they scored but I've been paying most of my attention to you guys that's fair that's fair I got a few guys playing in the game so <laughs> um the all-star game in Florida this year uh yeah they were saying there's a, some interesting Ideas, I guess. I, ideas floating around. One of them, you know, saucing some frozen hamburger patties to uh, to some alligators, <laughs> as as being uh, one of the skills competitions. <laughs> I just can't take that seriously. If that's actually going to happen, that'd be great. Uh, you know, in in like a dunk tank where you gotta shoot the puck at the uh, at the thing to try and dunk a teammate or something. Like, do you are you a fan of those fanatic or? Yeah, I don't care. Uh. You know, first of all, I'll say uh, I'm not taking full credit for this, but back in the day, I I pushed really hard for them to do the shootout. Uh, you know, these the show off shootout, whatever. I don't know what the heck they call it now. Like, I always thought they should do something like the slam dunk contest. Yeah, and uh, push really hard for the league that year and uh, to do the shootout, which has had mixed mixed success. Some years it's been good. I'm not even sure if they still do it, do they? The show they do. Last year, yeah. uh, who was it? Zegers came out as uh, oh, the average job. Yeah, no, 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 no average Joe. My bad. Oh, no, yeah, my average bad. Joe's. Sorry, yeah, sorry. If he came out in a fat suit looking like me, <laughs> I would have been fired up. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's the fact that it's still around means it's at least there's been moments, right, where they can show some personality, yeah. and that's what I always thought. So I'm not gonna anything they do. To me, if people get people should not get worked up about all-star. It is what it is. It's a, you know, it's, it, it's silly. And I think it probably should be silly. It should be for kids. I remember when I was a kid, I thought all-star game was the second biggest game of the year, right? Stanley cup final. Yeah. And then I grew up and realized none of these players give a crap and they all got out, yeah. go out and get drunk <laughs> and stay out till five o'clock in the morning, the night before the game. Right. Yeah. So, um, I think they should do, whatever whatever that might be entertaining and they they'll fail sometimes but i just you know there are hockey players that do have personality and there's more of them i think in in the league these days so any opportunity they have to to show personality i'm good for i really don't care i will i watch it you know it's one of those things i'll watch if i'm home um, I always watch the skills competition. The all star yeah. team doesn't really yeah. interest me. Yeah, the, like the three on three. Are they still doing the three on? Yeah, three yeah, I so. think so. Yeah, yeah I just, you know, it, to me, it's. Uh, I just I could take it or leave it, yeah. but uh, so whatever so, they want to do that's entertaining, whatever they want to try, they'll try. They can try. I got, I got a two part follow up on that. Yeah, they brought back the vote in of whoever you want. You just type in the name. Last time they did that, John Scott went to the NHL All-Star Game. So, if you, James Duffy, had your way, who's one guy that wouldn't be on, like, a, an All-Star radar if you could send to the game, who would it be? And you know what? I won't but even Somebody who's to... playing in the league? I won't even keep it to that. All time. If you could send oh, one person that probably doesn't deserve to be at an All-Star Game to an All-Star Game, who would it be? Jeff O'Neill, love it, <laughs> love out of, it. Out of retirement. Are we? Are we I talking that pre, guy. pre earring Jeff O'Neill or post earring? No, I want Jeff the full O'Neill. earring sticking out of the helmet. <laughs> I want everything. That'd be great. So, O Dog, uh, shoot your shot, buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. 
Uh, I mean, I can't even think of a player uh, in the league. That's the sad thing about hockey. I can't think of anybody who's wildly entertaining that's probably not worthy of an all-star. Uh, and which is a, again a problem with the game, but uh, I mean, we might be biased. I'd say Arbor Jacki. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, you I mean, know what? If they did that vote, I think he's got a chance. Yeah, like, great. He's got a heck yeah. of a shot. Yeah. I'm not saying he'd win the hardest shot, but he's got a heck of a shot. I mean, I remember computer class back in the day when it was all votes in. <laughs> yeah, and they're like last, you know, 20 minutes of the class, do whatever you want. I'm on NHL.com. Right. Smith, 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 right. Smith, 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 Smith. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, he'd be he'd be a great choice. I heard somebody mention him the other day, and uh, he's such a great story that I would love that. Yeah, and you know what? For the shootout, he could wear his Costco uh, vest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, second follow up question to that: We talked. You, you already had a great idea with the shootout, so we're going to give you full credit. No, <laughs> I don't. I, I want to make sure I don't get full credit for that. I'm just, I okay, want to many percent credit that to, to my man, James Duffy. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you have any other great ideas up your pipeline? No, no, I gave I'll up make on it more that. interesting. James, if your next idea ends up in the NHL All-Star game, I will get a tattoo of your face. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a great question. I haven't really tried to even be creative with it anymore because I guess I stopped caring a few years ago about the all-star game you know I used to host that that fantasy draft the first couple of years they did that you know when the players drafted each other and drafted yeah. the teams and yeah. I don't know if you remember back Phil Kessel oh the yeah of course oh, no. the last draft. Yeah, Phil. Poor Phil. I love it though yeah <laughs> so um I mean, I, like I said, I'm, I'm all for them trying anything. I don't have any wondrous idea to, to save the All-Star game. I think it's always going to be what it is. The players don't care. Nobody's going to hit anybody. You know, people have thrown out this idea of, you know, putting some big cash on it. So you won, you know, a couple million dollars or whatever. But, you know, which might matter to some rookie who's making minimum salary. But to most of these guys, even that wouldn't matter, right? And it would come across looking, you know, pretty greedy yeah. if it was huge, huge money. So... I, like I said, I think it is what it is. No matter what format you try, there's going to be flaws with it. And uh, it's for this. It's basically a schmooze for corporate sponsors. And hopefully some kids at home get a kick out of it. And I, I think that's all you're ever going to get out of it. Do you think that they would get more interest if they turn to what kind of baseball is doing now? And uh, even the NBA and kind of get maybe like a, a celebrity game going? Like I'd be more yeah. Interested. Maybe get you O O Dog and maybe Dave Poolin on a line. Well, you could get Beebs. You could get Beebs out there. He'd play probably, yeah. right? Beebs. I'm sure Cabby would lace him up. Jerry D. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of those NBA ones, you know, you get the odd like pretty big name, and then you get a few guys who are like, "What is this guy doing? I haven't seen him since he was, <laughs> he was a child star on like an yeah. '80s show." But uh, I would, I could dig a celebrity game if they could get enough guys to play. Would you, would you play? Cuba Gooding Jr. plays in L.A. Yeah. A, a little, would I play? Yeah. So here's my story <laughs> on hockey. I was never great. I lived in B.C. till I was eight. So when I moved to Ottawa, I'd never skated before. I was eight years old. And I was so I was well behind everybody. So I played house league for three years and learned to skate. I had those u- ugly, like, micron mascot, hard, you know. I always say it's like a pigeon wearing... Uh, like work boots uh that's what i look like and so i only played rep my last year of hockey and then i kind of i was 14 and then discovered girls and quit and i went and played i played like uh what should i call it intramurals in university for a year yeah Uh, and i thought you know what i'm pretty good still like i've actually got (laughs) better like in my six years not playing hockey i guess i've developed physically and i was actually scoring a lot of goals and I'm like I'm pretty good at this game and then I stopped playing and stopped like skating I had a bunch of kids and was moving around and I I didn't play again basically at all until uh you know I play a little ball hockey once in a while but and then I played a father-son game when my son was like eight or nine and like a lot of the dads were really good and I realized how crap I was and I actually wiped out and fell on the captain of the team and hurt him. And <laughs> I, I vowed that that was the end. I haven't played hockey since. It tra- traumatized me so much that I said, if, if I can play in a father-son game and wipe out on top of the captain of the team and, like, knock him out for a week, that my career is over. And you know and what? So- That's actually how Connor Bedard hurt his wrist. 
<laughs> Basically, <laughs> probably. Yeah. 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 It's actually so, funny. Uh, that yeah. was it. I was uh, I was done, and um, uh, my hockey career is over. And I will I will not brag about hockey. I'll brag about my flag football exploits, but I'll never b- brag about my hockey exploits because I just frankly was never that good. Well, you know what? We'll put you behind the bench. Celebrity <laughs> coach, James. Yeah. That I would do. Yeah. Well, I, I definitely this is one question I have to definitely ask. When um, there was you guys made the pa- the panel hangover, whose idea was that, and how did that come about? Obviously, the movie being so popular and stuff like that. But right. how did that come about? I know you guys shot it in L.A. because I believe the I think that's I'm just I think see it's not yeah. Film, so, yeah. um, I mean, I'll, I'll take. Taking credit most again. The... I love it. I love it. This, this I'll take most ideas, of the credit man. for that yeah. one. I love this guy. I do have a warped. Uh, <laughs> I have a bit of a warped mind. I don't get to do as many of those things as I used to, but I always liked really dumb. I grew up on David Letterman, like the old David Letterman when he was on NBC, and like he was one of the first guys who really brought dumb humor, I think, into into the world, and. Uh, I was fixated on him and from like 10 years old, I would watch every show he did. And so CSN has been very kind to let me do stupid things over the years. In, in this particular case, um, one of our producers, I believe it was Bill Dotson um, said, we had a, we had a guy who worked at the station named Rick, who unfortunately passed away quite suddenly a few years later. But, um, he looked like Zach Galifianakis. Zach, I can't say it. Zach Galifianakis. Yeah. Thank you, Zach Galifianakis. And he was a bit of a dead ringer. And so uh, Bill said you should do like a hangover thing with him. And so he planted the idea. I give him full credit. And then I kind of ran with it and came up. I had basically it was like writing a. You had to write like a four minute script and I had to figure yeah. out like how this would work and, and how to shoot an ending. And I remember I wanted Drager in it and he didn't want to go. He's busy. And I kind of lied to him and said, Hey, we'll have two days off in LA. It'll be really easy. And we only had actually like 24 hours there and we shot the entire 24 hours basically. Wow. Like we flew into LA, uh, like got there like four o'clock. There was a game that night, went to the game, went to these clubs after shot the next day, flew home the next night. And so it was like whirlwind guerrilla uh, cinematography, whatever you want to call it. So I had this whole story lined up about how we'd be like the panel would be in L.A. and we'd lose one of the guys on the panel, just like the hangover happened to be Aaron Ward at the time. And uh, because we had a wild night in L.A. the night before the game and we'd go talk to the Kings and I get them involved. I'm pretty good friends with Kopitar, who was playing along. But I didn't have an ending. Like, who was the guy who drugged us, right? And then it hit me one day that Daryl Sutter would be, like, perfect. But yeah, Daryl, yeah. I, I thought there was zero chance that Daryl Sutter would do this. I actually thought Daryl Sutter hated me. Because every time I interviewed him at the draft, which is, like, the one time I got to see him every year, like, he never answered my questions. Like, he'd give me, like, stone face looks. And then he always shook my hand when he got up and, like, almost broke my hand. Because that's a Sutter <laughs> handshake. It's a farm strength. Yeah. yeah and yeah. I thought, this guy hates me. So I wrote the PR guy for the uh, Kings. And it was a really weird email to write. Because I'm like, here's the deal. I'm doing a parody hangover. We're going to get drugged. We're going to blah, blah, blah. And I need, I need Daryl Sutter to film a scene where he drugs my drink. And make some comment about this. That's what you get. That's what the panel gets for picking the Canucks last year, whatever he said. Yeah. And I was like, we got no chance at this. And this is like two days before we're supposed to fly there. And I had no ending for the story. And the PR guy got back to me the next day and said, yeah, Daryl said yes. And I, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and it's still my favorite thing ever that he agreed to do that. Yeah. And um, yeah, so we, we flew. Uh, we did that and shot it. And the other thing is I tricked Matthew Perry into being in that thing not tricked him but i i knew exactly what i wanted matthew perry to say like i knew well, he's i was another old boy right yeah basically we went to the rink and we said who's here what celebrities are here and they said well there's matthew perry there's mary hart whatever and and they let us go try to interview them so i go into matthew perry in the suite i'm like hey we're doing a hangover parody he knew tsn thankfully and he said yeah i'll i'll, I'll play part of it and i already knew what i wanted to do 
I was in some drunken outfit and I was going to sit on his lap and I was going to say, Dregs, it's, I wanted to say, I wanted to purposely get his character wrong. I was going to say, it's Joey from Friends. It's Joey. <laughs> and, but I didn't want to tell Matthew Perry that because I didn't know how he'd react. So I'm like, hey, thanks so much for being in this, Matthew. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what could you say? Like, what could you say that would be funny? Like, what annoys you that people say to you that I could say to you that would be like, what annoys you? And he goes, he led, I, I don't he led like the question. I don't like when people say, you know, the guy from Friends. Hey, it's the guy from Friends. So I'm like, yeah, that would be good. But what if I said it's Joey from Friends? And he's like, oh, yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> and so I totally fed him. But uh, the fact awesome. that we got him in it and then Mary Hart and Mary Hart's husband, who's some billionaire, was like yelling at us because she didn't know. He didn't know what the hell we were doing. And it was the whole thing was cr crazy 24 hours, but it turned out pretty good. The other funny postscript to that and anyone who hasn't seen this it's on youtube i had the uh i was kind of playing a cross between the ed helms and the bradley cooper character i look more like ed helms but you know for the purpose of the thing so i got the mike tyson tattoo on my face yeah i'm hangover too and uh i forgot like it was a tattoo that stayed on your face for like three days like, it was <laughs> oh my god like one of those henna tattoos or whatever yeah, they yeah. call it and so we went out for dinner after we we're done filming that night before we we're going to get our catch our plane. And uh, we we're at some swanky restaurant in Manhattan beach. And I forgot I had the tattoo and I'm wearing like, you know, some preppy Lacosta shirt or something. Yeah. All these old couples, rich couples are at the restaurant staring at me. Right. And, and I'm just like, why are these people staring at me? And I went to the washroom and looked in the mirror and I'm like, Oh my God, I have a face tattoo. And and before uh, it was yeah, cool. so, before yeah. post Malone and <laughs> but anyway, thanks for remembering that because we did that and we did a bunch of things with Luongo and you know the puck over glass video. Those are some of my favorite things we've done at TSN because my bosses have been very good about letting me do really stupid things. Yeah, no, that is fantastic, and that's yeah. like prime like Jay and Dan as well. Like you said, Luongo and, and Corey Schneider feud videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. those are gold. Just yeah, gold. they're fun. They're fun. It's, you know what, the thing is, and you, know, you try to tell yourself all the time, it is only sports. Like, we care about it dearly. We get really passionate. Sometimes we cry when our teams lose. But in the end, it's an escape, right? And if you can't have fun doing stuff with sports, then uh, there's something wrong with you, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Great. Um, we'll, we'll talk about the, a little bit of a softer side of, of sports and – Chris Letang's dad passed away uh, this week. Um, and the Pens rerouted their game after playing in Arizona to go to Montreal, um, you know, to be with him uh, for his dad's funeral. I think, you know, that, that talks about kind of the camaraderie uh, in the sport and kind of the softer side of it where, uh, you know, you're talking, you were talking earlier about such a competitive edge that these guys have and it's, it's rah rah win win at all costs, but like to take a step out and to do that for your your teammate, and like they arrived in Montreal like five a.m. Like, yeah, just I think it speaks to the human side and kind of brings it back down on earth that these guys are people too. Yeah, and, and you know the term brotherhood gets used a lot, but I think it's really true in sports. You live with these guys, you spend more time probably with them than your family's cumulative hours over a year in a hockey season, right? And uh, I think with most teams, that's really the case. And uh, that doesn't surprise me whatsoever, right? They become your family for whatever time you're there. And, you know, athletes, for the most part, are good people. There's there's bad apples everywhere like there is in society. You know, there's jerks everywhere. But for the most part, I think most of them are good people. And, you know, hockey certainly has its issues. And they have rose to the forefront over the last couple of years. And, and, and good thing. And people can talk about hockey culture and there are some really bad sides to hockey culture that need to change, but there's also, there's also a lot of good sides and there's a lot of good people in hockey and what you're pointing out. There's a really good example of it. I think. Um, lighter side of hockey. Now. <laughs> um, these digitized ads, the amount of people that are editing them uh, to make it kind of whatever they want it to look like, <laughs> uh, and kind of make a mockery of it. Uh, I seen one the other day on Twitter from uh, from Pete Blackburn, and it says that Gary Bettman is cool, and then it's all pictures of Gary Bettman, and behind the net it says, and handsome too. 
Um, <laughs> what, what do you think of these digitized ads? Uh, I, they haven't bothered me as much as they bothered some people. I mean, they're a little bit of a pain in the butt, but I don't know. I get it, right? You're, you're doing whatever you can to make as much money for the game as possible. And, uh, hey, if your team's salary cap goes, if the Habs salary cap goes up a couple million and when you're co super competitive again in two or three years, you can sign another guy because maybe they brought in another whatever million dollars from digital ads. I'm just too... I just, just too many other things for me in the world to worry about than worry about some. I don't, I guess they're a little bit distracting, but I think like anything else, I just get used to it. I remember when the first down line went in in football and some people said that's distracting from, from I'm old enough to remember when that yellow first line down line went in and people were like, this is taken away from the purity of the game. But now what would we do without it? Right. Yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah, <laughs> or the bug, you know, again, I'm old enough where the bug, uh, what we call the bug, which is the top of the corner of the screen that shows the score, right? Yeah. You know, I grew up in an age where none of that happened. And now if the bug was down for 30 seconds, you're like, where's my damn score? So I know what time yeah. the game it is. So I think we'll get used to everything else and it, it doesn't bother me. The glitches in it reminds me, though, who was it that came out with the uh, the puck? It was the puck tracker. The box. Oh, 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 the puck. Yeah. Oh, that, it was that actually, just reminds me of. Oh, yeah. To me, like the glow puck... It was what it was called. It had some merit if they used it, you know, like just in replays or something. Yeah. It just just in intermissions. To have it the whole game was ridiculous. But I think there was – if they used it sparingly, it would have been more successful. Yeah. They tried yeah, to almost, stick it in the game yeah, and not realizing I like that. That's your next yeah. headline. Yeah, bring the, the puck bring tracker back. back. Yeah. yeah. Only on replays yeah. whenever they draw the X's and O's uh, at intermission and – yeah, exactly. There you go. Dothy, just yeah, an ideas yeah, guy. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Hey, boys, I got about a four minute window before I got to go pick up my daughter. I hope that I don't want to four rush no, you through things. Is that okay? Fine. Do you want to touch this? Yeah, this, is our, this is the last thing we had, anyways. You know, in the last couple of days after the uh, the World Junior happened, a few guys they either from Play for Canada or went back to their teams in the OHL, the WHL, got moved or got shifted over. You know, Shane Wright being one of them. All these draft picks that are being involved. Right. But these like I crazy amounts. Like, you know, you've seen guys get traded, you know, one or two draft picks and future considerations, but you're looking at like eight to ten draft picks. Do you think this is like just because these guys are so good and maybe it'll switch like next year, or you think this will be like something that's gonna continue on? Yeah, I'd like to go back. Like I, I don't know. I this these trades have happened forever. And but maybe they get more attention now. I'm not sure that they've ever had the volume of this many picks, but I know there's usually you know, six involved or something. This is, you know, the way of junior hockey is you go for it for a couple of years. And then, you know, unless like certain teams like the London Knights or whatever seem to be good all the time, but uh, the real rich junior franchises. But for the most part, you have a crap, you have like a two year window maybe where you have a ton of talent, you go for it and you go for the Memorial Cup. And then you, you sort of rebuild for the next five or six or whatever that is. And, and it, it's in, in some ways I wish wouldn't it be great if the NHL was like this if all the great big stars got traded every year at the deadline <laughs> yeah, yeah that'd be great like it's amazing like the every basically junior hockey I, I'm, I'm not I shouldn't suggest this because uh you know we did we'll end up doing an eight-hour show but Matt if you had a if you if you waited if you told all the CHL to wait until like the deadline day and all these deals were announced and you had the, you know, the 10 biggest players in junior hockey traded every single year it would be, it's insane, yeah. but it's, it's just the way of the world that, you know, every year there's four or five teams that really go for it in each one of the particular leagues. And, um, and so you get these nutty trades like that, where we're just going to mortgage our future for the next two to three years to try to win a Memorial cup or get to a Memorial cup. And then we'll worry about next year, making trades to get those draft picks back ourselves. But it is, it is insane when you, Especially when you see it on what we call a board, like on Sports Center, yeah. <laughs> you see yeah. these nine picks on the one yeah. side of the column. It's insane. well, especially today is Dylan Gunther, who's still in Arizona, may not even play junior hockey again. And there was like a hall of six picks and two players, and I was just like, "You are." Bad. They got to know he's going back. In, in yeah, that case, there's got to be something. They got. They got. They. I don't think you make that deal unless you know he's going back. Like the Zellweger one was. The, I don't know if that's the one with the most tr the oh, picks. Oh, that was or, ridiculous. Or, yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Now, he's the guy, like, that guy. Shane Wright's an awesome player, 
Um, but Zellweger would be a guy I think that like that guy could win you a Memorial Cup. Like he can play 32 minutes a game in the playoffs and be incredible. So, uh, yeah. Bedard would be fascinating, but apparently he's not going to get traded. So yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we figured that was a long yeah. shot. But yeah, the, the odds on FanDuel weren't my favorite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, James, I appreciate you uh, giving the time, and, and it was trying. And I'm sure you're sick of seeing my name pop up in your emails every couple of days. Uh, but we definitely appreciate you coming on. I had a blast. This yeah. is a uh, you know my World Cup, my Stanley Cup final. Um, so I definitely appreciate you coming on. Hopefully we we have you again in the future if you enjoyed yourself. Um, but thanks, and uh, look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks on uh, on my on my. On Trace, yeah. I'm actually feeling something sick, Tracy. That's my boss. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna have to have that day off. Well, I appreciate it, boys. Uh, again, sorry it took so long to figure this out, but uh, uh, my pleasure coming on, and for sure we'll do it again someday. Okay. All right, perfect. Appreciate it, James. You take care. Thanks, James. All, the, all the best. See you guys. Bye. Both guys, five minutes each for fighting. Wow. So you're yeah, saying that was... there was another city. No, yeah. So just because of the president, okay. So this is the same league president. We didn't we didn't really like him much, right? He was a he was a bit of a I don't know. I don't I don't know. I don't remember why, but we just we didn't have too much in common with this guy, right? So he's he's a little bit of a weasel, and he's he's coming to the bar at the hotel, and he wants to have drinks with us, and he's been drinking probably all game, and we lost that night. So we're just sitting at the bar having a few drinks, just relaxing because we gotta we gotta uh, the next morning we're driving out. So he's on us, he's being a pain in the ass, and we're like, get out of here, right? He wants to talk, and he wants to, you know. So we end up, he goes, he goes to bed. He goes to bed. And then, uh, so I'll name the players. There's uh, me, Ben Deschamps, um, LP Charbonneau, um, <laughs> Denny Lamoureux, um, probably other guys, but I'll keep it at that for now. So we start thinking, we have a few drinks and we, we get snowed in that night. We have to leave. That's why we're staying overnight. That's right. We got snowed in. So we're only traveling the next day. So um, we get upstairs and then, uh, and then Ben goes, uh, let's, let's get, uh, what's his name? Let's get the president. So we got to find a way to get into his room, right? So we send somebody down, one of the rookies and we're like, you got to make sure you get a key to this room. So you got to lie. You got to say your families or whatever you're, right you're you know this guy you're related so he gets the key and we're like oh boy here we go so we go in and we get we <laughs> we make masks with towels or something right and he's this guy's sleeping he's passed out he's drunk right so we we make masks with with the towels and we run in and we just we just soak them with a like a in poubelle there a garbage pail full of water and we just drench them. So that starts it that starts out that way. So the guys are drinking a little bit. We're having fun. And then um, what we used to do back those days the the funny thing was to put water in a little garbage pail and you lean it against the door and then you knock at the door and then the guy the guy sees there's nobody through the peephole. And then he opens the door and as he opens the door, the water soaks the, the room. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's the funny, whatever rookie move to do. So we're doing the water stuff for a bit. One of the guys just loses it. He gets the hose. He gets the hose out, the fire hose from the thing, the little, the little uh, window there, the door there. Yeah. He gets the hose and then <laughs> He comes up to the door and he puts it at the bottom of the door and he opens the fire hose in the hotel. The water's pissing through my room, like going through the, the floor and then right up to the ceiling. So there's, there's fire hose going on. We're, we're like the guy, I won't name the guy that did it, but he's just losing it. He's just having a ball. He's having fun. Right? So we expect at that moment, we're like, okay, we're in trouble. And we're like, we're expecting somebody from downstairs from front desk, right, to, to show up and then just lose their shit. And then we get in trouble and we get kicked out. <laughs> Never anybody showed up. Nobody noticed nothing. Okay, so 
the party, the that part of the party just goes on for like honestly, Corey was sleeping, right? Well, I'll make sure to mention that Corey was sleeping, he's got nothing to do with this, <laughs> but it honestly <laughs> it honestly went on for a long time. Okay, the 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 la was up on the the fire hose was used for more than one room. Okay, let's put it this way. We eventually go to bed. Nobody showed up. We're completely, we're just confused why nobody showed up yet, right? No, no maid or no, nobody, right? So we 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 fell asleep and end up knocking on our doors. The cleaning ladies are losing it. They're like, what's going on, right? What did you guys do here? Because the, the hallway is soaked. The, the carpet is just drenched. So they start knocking on doors and we're like, oh, just simple, oh, just simple. Oh, nobody knows, nobody knows nothing. So listen to this. We go to check out and as we're leaving, I won't name the name of the owner, but one of the owners comes up to the front desk and the lady goes, ça va coûter mille piastres de dommage pour, le, pour le, les tapis et les euh, l'eau. <laughs> and she says it'll be an extra thousand bucks. He got out, he got his, he fouillé dans sa poche, he just looked in his pocket forked out 10 $100 bills and he gives it to her and he looked at me and he goes, Papa, I don't need fun for me to pass on my. He said, we had fun. We had about $1,000 fun. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and that was it. I thought we'd get in trouble for that, but no, we didn't get it. That was it. But yeah, oh. that was quite, uh, quite. Just the, when uh, I thought this league couldn't get more interesting. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh. That was awesome. Yeah. Oh, la, la. Wow. Yeah, uh, and I didn't expect Corey in on that. Corey, uh, you're tame. Well, <laughs> hey, my roommate was Kenny McLeod. <laughs> yeah. I don't, oh, la, la. I don't know if the hose was going underneath our door. Yeah, yeah. Kenny was a tough customer. I don't know if I would have uh, I would have yeah. pulled anything with Kenny. Oh, man. That's there's a lot of pressure in that hose. I'll tell you that much. There's a lot <laughs> well, of, that's they the just thing. I can just imagine. Oh man, it was pissing up to the roof, to the ceiling for sure. But the thing is, I I never understood why the there wasn't an alarm that went off. Like nothing yeah. went off. That the, the water was going, but there was no <laughs> nothing. Well, I just that's, wonder that's, how many people are going to be watching this and getting ideas now. Well, fuck, now we know the, there's no <laughs> alarm going off. It says there, I oh, don't pull a it'll trigger alarm. Well, they we know that's a lie now. I'll tell you one thing, the guy that was operating that hose. Oh wow. Yeah. He uh... the one thing so far that I've I've gathered from from this interview is you don't want to be caught anywhere near Benoit Deschamps. <laughs> and I'll give you a hint, it wasn't Ben Deschamps. It wasn't Ben. The hose wasn't Ben this year, but uh, you're narrowing it in. You're you're pretty good. Well, you only uh, named five people, uh, <laughs> and you said oh, it wasn't nah, you because nah. you were in your bed. So I already know two out of the five. It's uh, there. You so go. You, you left us with LP, uh, <laughs> LP, and Denny Lamoureux. Oh, la, la. So, Corey, well, I'm assuming you had heard that before before Paul just said that. Well, he was there. He was I sleeping. Was but he well, he was up, sleeping. He was sleeping. He walked, he, he walked up into the water in the morning, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, when we walked out in the hallway, the hose was unraveled out of the thing. We, I didn't saw even it. bother to try and cover it up. <laughs> it, uh, this guy's full. They don't wrap it up after they're done and they're put <laughs> Oh, man. Jesus, Murphy. Wow. I hadn't talked about that in a long time. That's funny. Oh, that wow. is. That's uh, that's wild. Yeah. <laughs> ah, but to actually see a guy use it in a hallway and like, come on, you're losing your mind right now. You're out. <laughs> he's just <laughs> laughing. This was nothing. I guess he's he wasn't up to his first prank for sure, man. Wow. Ah, you. Just see, though. 